Landstalker's story goes something like this. Nigel, a skilled treasure hunter and his newfound and extremely jealous fairy companion Friday, are on the hunt for the lost fortune of King Noel. Competition is fierce, and Nigel and company were repeatedly tangled with bumbling and not-so-bumbling rivals as they search for epic loot throughout the Isle of Mercator. It's a refreshingly different storyline that eschews the Save the World trope in favor of madcap adventure. Despite its unadulterated charm, the game has the unfortunate reputation for being Sega's weird isometric Zelda clone. But aside from featuring an elf with a penchant for wearing green clothing and obsessively hoarding heart containers, Landstalker doesn't actually play like Nintendo's powerhouse series. In fact, the isometric action-adventure genre predates the original Zelda by nearly two years, debuting with the release of Night Lore on the ZX Spectrum. A slew of Me Too knockoffs were developed for various systems before the inevitable death of the genre in light of actual 3D gaming. The fact remains that Landstalker plays way more like the SNES dungeon puzzler Equinox with its perspective-based platforming than it does A Link to the Past. Essentially, Landstalker is an action-adventure game with light RPG mechanics. You travel from town to town, solve the local crises of the day, watch some genuinely amusing cutscenes, and delve into the puzzle-laden dungeons. Nigel's HP is increased by gathering livestock, heart-shaped containers which must be found or purchased throughout the game. Gathering 10 containers earns Nigel a full heart, which increases hidden attack and defense ratings. These scores are also improved by upgrading his equipment, armor, swords, boots, and rings hidden throughout the game. Enemies deal varying amounts of damage based on your stats, and upon dying, Nigel's lifeless body flops over and Friday delivers an emergency dose of Eka Eka, Mercator's regional healing specialty. Run out of healing herbs, and the game reloads from your latest save file. Fortunately, you can carry 9 of any renewable item at a time, and enemies sporadically drop refills rendering Game Overs a very rare occurrence. But before delving further into the gameplay, let's examine the interesting history behind Landstalker's conception. Both Shining in the Darkness and the original Shining Force were developed by Climax Entertainment and Sonic Co, aka Sonic Software Planning, aka Camelot, who, ironically enough, never made a single Sonic game, but has developed numerous Mario Sports titles. Anyway, the third game in the series was to be Shining Rogue, a light-hearted action RPG which would chronicle the adventures of Max following the defeat of Dark Dragon. But sadly, creative differences split the collaboration for good. Sonic Co., a first-party developer for Sega, naturally retained the Shining license, and Climax was forced to rebrand their brainchild as Landstalker. This was the point at which the Shining series lost its visual identity. Previously, Yoshitaka Tamaki's unique illustrative style had defined the Shining series in the same way that Akira Toriyama's had for the Dragon Quest games. But Sonic Co's loss was Climax's gain, because Landstalker is absolutely gorgeous. The colors are surprisingly vibrant for a Genesis title, with huge sprites and an immersive 3D universe that closer resembles something you'd expect to see in a PlayStation game than on a 16-bit title from 1992. The visuals are more than mere decorative eye candy, though. Many of Landstalker's puzzles rely on the optical illusions created by the isometric perspective. It's a clever design choice that is very much integral to the gameplay. The only downside to this perspective is that it's hard to judge exactly where a platform is meant to be floating in the air, especially with the absence of shadows. Often, the only way to find out is through trial and error. In fact, naysayers often lament the difficulty of the diagonal jumps, However, I found the learning curve to be extremely reasonable. Beginning dungeons ease you into the mechanics of jumping, with the challenge gradually increasing as the story progresses. Later dungeons are indeed difficult, and you will backtrack through multiple rooms to reattempt frustrating jumps. But the task is never impossible, and the truly rage-inducing feats in human skill are generally reserved for optional side quests and for unlocking special gear. I won't say that the game didn't occasionally reduce me to screaming unintelligible strings profanity, but you're expected to earn your completionist status, and I can't say that that's a bad thing. I genuinely appreciate how each dungeon is distinctive, both visually and objectively. Some emphasize the game's hack-and-slash combat, others focus mainly on platform jumping and block puzzles, 
and one dungeon is nearly devoid of monsters and instead features a series of brain teasers and riddles. This sort of gameplay variety keeps Landstalker feeling fresh and rewards the player for sticking through the tougher objectives. My one nagging complaint with the game has to be the diagonal controls. Granted, you can't have an isometric game without diagonals, and for the most part the movement is surprisingly fluid, but it can be aggravatingly difficult to nudge Nigel in the right direction. Something you'll need to do frequently when jumping or placing blocks requires any degree of precision. More often than not, you'll nudge Nigel right off a platform. An annoying setback, to say the least. Otherwise, Landstalker is a solid gaming experience backed by a humorous storyline, easily ranking among the best RPGs the system has to offer. <laughs>